I have looked at a process that happens in the C. elegans mother that is absolutely essential for its progeny, for its children, to be able to divide their cells. And so to jump into this project. Oh, yes, it's going. All right. Let's remind ourselves that we're all made up of a trillion cells. And this is just hard to fathom, even hard to, to picture this. So a trillion cells, but even if you look at the single cell level, there's so much going on, right? Our cells are very busy places. Like think of a cell as a metropole, maybe like London, New York, lots of things happening at the same time. Here, there's a visual representation of what the inside of a cell might look like. Um, but yeah, so lots of things happening, but all these things come down to what the cell has stored in at its core in the nucleus, because it's here where we find the genetic information or like we all know it, the DNA. And so for the purpose of this talk, I'd like you to think of DNA as a cookbook, as a cookbook that contains all the recipes necessary for life for, for all these processes that happen in the cell. And so when you think of a multicellular organism, of course, this, you know, cells need to divide, you know, it needs to go from one fertilized cell, an embryo, to a well, trillion cells in the case of humans, right? So an essential problem or uh, challenge to the cell then, right, it needs to divide, is to make sure that this DNA, this genetic material, is passed down to its daughter cells correctly. So it, it receives exactly the same copy. So what you need to be doing as a, as a cell that wants to divide is replicate your DNA and then divide and make sure that both daughter cells re receive a proper copy. So this form of cell division we know as mitosis. And there is a more specialized form of cell division as well that I'd like to mention here, which we, which we know as meiosis, where the goal is to create germ cells. And so germ cells are the female oocyte or the male sperm. These can fuse, create a new organism that then is again going to re-enter into this mitotic cell cycle, start dividing, uh, start uh, creates a multicellular organism. But before a cell can even think of dividing its DNA, segregating its DNA, it first needs to tackle a very, very basic problem is that to, in order, it's very difficult actually to, well, DNA is, is very long, if you would stretch it out, and the fact that it could fit into this small nucleus is actually quite a miracle. So to give you an analogy for this, it's like fitting 40 kilometers of fine thread into a tennis ball. That's what you're looking at here. So this is quite a feat, actually. And what is at the, the basis of this, of accomplishing this feat, is this structure that you see here, zoom, uh, zooming in on this, this structure that we know as the nucleosome. So the nucleosome consists of histone proteins, different histone proteins, actually. These are different family of histone proteins um, that stick together as a, an octomer. So there's eight of them, and they wrap around DNA, they wrap, you know, wrap DNA around itself. And that is the basic, basic packaging unit of DNA. Then there's further processes that help this further compaction of DNA until you find it in its most compact form, and also the form that I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, right here, the chromosome. And so when you think of a chromosome, what you're actually seeing are two copies. You see a copy on the left and one on the right, and these are called the sister chromatids. And these sister chromatids are held together at a very specific point. You can already see it here. I'll show you this to make it even more clear. These two sister chromatids, the left and the right, are held together here or at the specific region here in the middle, this is actually in the situation of a human cell. Um, and that's where you find uh, the centromere. It's going to be essential to, to this talk, right? This is where the sister chromatids are held together. And the centromere is essential for, for attracting um, a lot of proteins that together make up a machinery called the kinetochore, it's in, depicted in green here, which can attract and bind microtubules, spindles that come from both sides that can bind to these kinetic cores and can then exert force to segregate these sister chromatids nicely. And so I'm imagining that many of you have a hard time visualizing this. So that's why I included this video here. So this is a very elegant process that happens every cell division, right? So this is this segregation of these sister chromatids. And to stress how important this is, if this goes wrong, you, you know, you, you have 
some real trouble as a cell, you you have things like developmental arrest or think of things like cancer. The cell has to make sure that this goes right. right? So I can't stress enough how important this this beautiful, elegant process is. And so in my project, I've only, re well, I've been most interested in actually one recipe, specific recipe for a specific protein in this book of life that is DNA, namely the centromere protein. So I'll be calling it Sempe from now on. So Sempe uh, is laid down in this book of life in DNA as a, as a gene. So it's, it's, uh, it, this gene codes for Sempe. It's a four letter code. I won't go into too much detail here, but here in yellow, I highlighted what is actually the gene coding for this centromere protein, Sempe. So as I said, if this would be the ingredients, then the protein would be the dish. Right, so that's what, what's, what's the end result. And that's a string of amino acids, again, depicted as letters here. Won't tell you much perhaps, and that's why I want to visualize this. And what is, what is the actual end product? What is Sempe? It is a histone protein. So hopefully you've remembered from my previous slide what this, what this is, it can fit into a nucleosome. And like any other histone protein, it has these two very um, clear domains, regions. One is the histone fault domain, here that uh, is in the core of the nucleosome. It's very structured, it's very conserved also when you look across uh, species. And then you have this N-terminal tail that is very unstructured and um, kind of sticks out of the nucleosome. And so Sempe is a histone protein, but it's actually a very special histone protein, right? So the most common histone protein, uh, proteins are H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 that form this nucleosome. And Sempe is only incorporated where the centromere needs to be. So it kicks out H3, the canonical H3, and it replaces it. Uh, and this actually forms the centromere, or marks the centromere, this is the start of the centromere. So Sempe incorporation into this nucleosome makes the centromere, which therefore makes Sempe really important, right? To make sure that this is incorporated at the right place where the, where the centromere has to be formed. And so when you look across species, this is not the only way that you can organize your centromere or where centromere is, um, is incorporated. There's several ways that species have species are doing this. There's uh, species where sempe is only in one nucleosome, a very specific point on the chromosome, we call this a point centromere, that you can find in budding yeast. Then there's a situation that I've been telling you about so far. This is the human situation, or at least there's also other species that share this feature. Uh, is where uh, the centromere is formed in a region on the chromosome. So multiple sempe incorporation, uh, incorpor uh, incorporations happening in this region, but again, it's bounded. And this, and, and then there's a third form uh, where it's still very specific where sempe goes, but it's, it can be seen all over, the cent all, all over the chromosome. And this form of organization we know as the holocentromere. And we used to think of the holocentromere maybe as being a bit rare, but actually that's not true at all. There's a lot of uh, species that have this, share this form of organization. And one of these species are the nematodes. And the nematodes that we work on is C. elegans. Um, so the C. elegans has this form of centromere organization. I still want to stress, maybe going back to this slide, that Sempe incorporation, despite that the organization is different, it's never random, right? It's in all cases, so important that it not go, knows where to go, goes to the right places where the centromere needs to be formed. And so C. elegans has this organization. And here, I'd like to give you a bit of a breather. Uh, and also, I'd like to introduce you to C. elegans as a model system, uh, and in particular, as a model system for studying cell division. So C. elegans actually stands for Kynorhabditis elegans. That's a very difficult name, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be using that. I'm just gonna say C. elegans. And as the name already implies, it's very elegant. It's a beautiful creature. Uh, it moves in the sinusoidal ways, as you can see here. And the thing is that it's actually a very complex organism, but on the other hand, it's simple enough that we can study it in great detail. And so when you look at it from the perspective of studying it in a lab setting, what is great is that they're very small, right? The adults are one to two millimeters in length and um, they feed on bacteria. Uh, so what we have in the lab are these plates that we seed with bacteria and where these worms can just, you know, grow and, and be happy. And so we can grow whole populations of worms on just this tiny small plate, right? So that's wonderful for, for a lab. 
Um, actually, I also wanted to mention, I forgot, um, is that Cialion is actually very common. You could go to your garden, get some compost, and you would find these guys, right? They're almost everywhere across the world, very um, successful species, actually, you could say. And they are see-through, which is great for us as biologists. People have called them a transparent window into biology. Right? You can see all the structures of C. elegans just, just by looking at them. And actually, you have genetics tricks as well to make, to make sure that you can look at things even better. Right? So here, a protein has been tagged with a fluorophore that we can see uh, and visualize. And that actually, in this case, visualizes the germline where germ cells are produced and embryos. And why I name these specific structures is because this is where I'm heading. This is where cell division happens. And this is, these are very pronounced structures in C. elegans. So you can really study cell division very nicely. Here I have to mention that C. elegans is mostly found as an hermaphrodite. So this means that it can make both germ cells. It can make both sperm and oocytes. So what, you, what the C. elegans um, development look, looks like, so in earlier development, C. elegans uh, creates um, sperm. This is stored in the spermatheca. And then as an adult, you would find only, um, you would find the worms making uh, oocytes. So this is a maternal germline, you could say. So this is the situation for an adult hermaphrodite. This is what you're seeing. Again, it's the worm itself is almost a tube and it has two large tubes in it that are the germlines where the germ cells are created. And if you zoom in on one germline, which I've done here, you see both types of cell division happening in this germline. You see mitosis here, cells dividing mitotically, entering meiosis, female meiosis. Oocytes are produced. They move through the spermatheca. Fertilization occurs, and then these fertilized cells, they are embryos, they will again start up uh, into the mitotic cell cycle. These are cells in mitosis. So again, this is almost a test tube for studying cell division. And to make that even more clear, you can actually see cell division by eye. I think that is just beautiful actually for C. elegans. So this is um, a YouTube video. You can actually watch it all the way to seeing the worm hatch from this egg. From this egg. I'm not gonna show you that for the sake of time, but here's the first cell divisions that you can follow by eye uh, in, in a C. elegans embryo. So that's beautiful. And then also, I told you about these genetics techniques. You can use them to your advantage when studying um, cell division, or in our case, we are interested in SEMPE, right? Hopefully you haven't, uh, haven't uh, made you forget at this point. That's, that's the protein that I am interested in. And so here we are looking at SEMPE in real life by having put a fluorophore on it, and here, this is an embryo that has just, so it's just been fertilized. So here, I just show you what that would look like. So we're just looking at Sempe in, in action. Uh, here, I have to credit uh, Joanna Venda for helping me with, uh, with making these videos. Um, but look how beautiful this is, right? You can see the chromosomes light up, uh, line up and then divide. So again, genetic techniques we can use to study Sempe in C. elegans. And to understand something very interesting that we found regarding Sempe in C. elegans, in the germline specifically. I need to tell you a bit more about how we think of cells maintaining Sempe. Because again, Sempe marks the centromere, which is so essential for segregation of chromosomes to go right. So how we like to think of it is, is put in this scheme. Uh, so we think of this as, as Sempe being at the right locations. And there's a tricky part in the cell cycle where um, the DNA has to be um, replicated, has to be copied. But in this process, you'll lose a lot of the SEMPE molecules that were at the right place. SEMPE will be diluted. And so uh, the cell doesn't like this at all, right? It wants to maintain SEMPE at the right places. And so what you can see happening in many cell, uh, in many, many systems, is that uh, SEMPE, okay, it's maybe it's diluted, it's lost in some nucleos, nucleosomes that had it previously, but then it's reloaded in the same cell cycle in some species or in the next cell cycle for other species. Depend, again, this depends on the species, but it's very quickly reloaded to make sure that SEMPE location is always maintained, right? So, because again, this is so important for setting the centromere right, that the cell cannot forget about where SEMPE needs to go. So now let's turn an eye to SEMPE in the C. elegans germline. And hopefully you'll already be able to see what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to get at, which is that SEMPE, is present here in the distal region where cells are in mitosis, but then it's removed. It's removed altogether. You can't see it anymore in packeting, and then it, and then the, which is in, in meiosis, female meiosis, and then it, it reappears later. 
And so this is was puzzling to us because how can Sempe be removed altogether and how can then Sempe find its way back without having any help from all Sempe molecules uh, finding finding the right place? So so this is really the core of my thesis, right? This is where I'm working to, against uh, towards is this observation that is very unique to C. elegans that we want to understand. Also here, I want to stress just for clarity's sake, that um, Senpei actually is inherited through the female germline. It's not in sperm. So how how Senpei goes to the next generation is through is through the mother. So I'm going to be referring to, to the word mostly as mothers. They are hermaphrodite, as I said before, but it's where it's in the female germline where Senpei is inherited. So to move back to this question, it's removed. How is that happening? That was question number one. How is Senpei removed? And then the second question would be, how does it find its way back to the right places without having any help? Uh, so in a cartoon version, that would be, this would be kind of the summary of my, my thesis work in a way. Like this is what I'm aiming to understand. And so to do so, um, I thought we probably need to know about more uh, interacting partners, part of proteins that could affect Senpei functioning in C. elegans uh, that could, you know, help help maybe in this removal or in this reintroduction, are there factors that can uh, play a role in this process? And why is it, this is relevant, so relevant for C. elegans specifically, is that there's actually not a lot of proteins that have been reported to have an interaction with Senpei. And this is a little odd because in a lot of other systems, there's actually quite a lot of uh, interacting partners that uh, Senpei has, okay, uh, depends on the species. But in C. elegans, we know of literally two factors that have a direct influence on Senpei functioning. So that's not much. And we we had no more information to go on. And our aim, therefore, was can we find more interacting partners of Senpei in C. elegans specifically? And so this is where I started. Um, and to answer that, I use this IP mass spec technique. And I'm going to be summarizing basically a year worth of work in one slide, and that happens often in science, right? You're not going to show your failed attempts. Um, I'm just going to show you how I did it, but just to give you a more realistic picture of how, how science is done. Uh, so here, what we what the aim was is we gave Senpei almost like a handle to be able to pull it out of our sample, which were basically embryonic samples. So these were embryos from C. elegans, uh, lots of them. And then we were able to specifically pull out Senpei from this sample. And the idea behind this is that when you pull on Senpei, you might also pull other factors along with it. And this is called a co-IP. So other factors that interact or might interact with Senpei directly or indirectly sometimes, they would come along when you pull on Senpei. So I did this, I pulled Senpei, I sent this, uh, this, this sample to Zurich where they did mass spectrometry for me and identified proteins in this sample. Of course, they identified Senpei, so my pulling worked but they also identified other factors, which was great. So other factors that could interact potentially with Senpei. So that's here in five. There's a list that was actually way more extensive than this list, but there's a few factors here that came along with Senpei that are going to be relevant for this talk. UBA1, a ubiquitin activating enzyme, MET33, a ubiquitin peptidase, and KNL2, which if you were very uh, attentive, I already showed you in the slide that we already know that that interacts with uh, Senpei, so that actually with a good positive control as well. Uh, so why am I highlighting these factors? Well, I'll get to that now. So in part one, again, our aim is to understand how Senpei is removed uh, at this mitosis to meiosis transition in the adult hermaphrodite germline. And so we had UBA1. Remember, it's a ubiquitin activating enzyme. Why is this interesting to us? Well, it's because we know the ubiquitin proteasome pathway is almost like the cleaning surface of the cell. Uh, it's, um, it is, I will try and walk you through it. UBA1 is an activating enzyme. It activates, so it activates ubiquitin. And ubiquitin is almost like a sticker that's going to sit on proteins that need to be degraded, that need to be destroyed. So here, UBA1 starts this process where ubiquitin is, through other, uh, other um, components, is put on the substrate, the target protein, which in this case could be Senpei, and then it receives these ubiquitin marks, like these, these removal stickers in a way, which make it um, 
recognizable to, let's call it the bin, the rubbish bin of the cell, the proteasome, that is going to recognize this ubiquitinated target protein and is going to cut it up, going to destroy that protein specifically. And so here, let me uh, fo focus your attention on UBA1, which starts this whole thing, and then RPT2 as well, which is part of this proteasome, the rubbish bin, let's put it, let's put it that way. And so as geneticists, one of the oldest tricks in the book is to sabotage this thing, right? Sabotage this cleaning system, this ubiquitin proteasome pathway, and see what happens at the level of SEMPE. So that's exactly what we did. So we were sabotaging this system by removing either UBA1, the start, or RPT2, which is this, the proteasome component, and then see what happens to SEMPE. And that was actually really quite clear that this something was really going was really going on here, uh, because in the situation where we did nothing, as I already showed you before, SEMPE is not present in this packetin region, not at all. But when you remove UBA1 or RPT2 by a technique that we call RNAi, then you see SEMPE all all of a sudden appear in this or stay in this region in packetin where it's usually not present. So in a way, it's SEMPE spreads throughout the entire germline now. So this is a good indication that indeed this system, this ubiquitin proteasome pathway has a role to play in removing SEMPE normally at this distal end of the germline. Then there was another factor. And actually what I should say is that ubiquitin is, ubiquitilation of protein is not a one-way street. There's a, a, almost a reverse where you ubiquitilate proteins, make marking them for destruction, but you can also de-ubiquitolate protein by, by certain, um, there's certain dedicated proteins that do this. And one of these proteins that can de-ubiquitolate is MET33. And as you remember, this was also in our screen. So in this, in this line of thought, we wanted to see, okay, what happens then if we sabotage MET33, right? It's almost like, probably like acting like a shield, most likely for SEMPE, not to get destroyed. So hopefully then you can, you can almost see this coming is when you remove MET33, here's actually a genetic knockout, then SEMPE, where usually it's very much present at this distal part, um, right? Is this the, the unedited, um, you know, this is what it looks like in the other an unedited worm. And here, when your MET33 is taken away, you can hardly see SEMPE anymore, right? So in a way, how we like to think of that here, we quantify this effect. How we like to think of that is like MET33 acts like a shield almost for SEMPE, not to be ubiquitolated too soon and not to be destroyed prematurely already in this distal region. And so to summarize, therefore, part one, this is what we think is happening. Here, where SEMPE is present, it's shielded by this MET33 factor. And when somehow this is lost, this interaction, we don't know exactly how, but when this um, is lost, then ubiquitin has, has, um, has the ability to sit on SEMPE and destroy it which is happening at this mitosis meiosis transition, because if you knock down this ubiquitin proteasome pathway, it will spread, um, again, hinting at an, a function of this, this pathway in SEMPE removal. So this is part one, how is SEMPE removed? But then part two is maybe the more interesting one. It's how is then SEMPE able to find its way back after being completely removed? Let me remind you that is an old thing, right? Because normally we like to think of this as SEMPE never being completely removed, always, um, well, diluted uh, by replication, but then reloaded straight away well, or in the next cell cycle to make sure that SEMPE never loses uh, its way. Again, in the C. elegans germline, we find something else. So the, the question is interesting, like how can SEMPE find its way back without uh, old SEMPE sticking around? And to answer this question, we turned our eye to KNL2. Again, this was one of the factors in the screen. And why? Because this KNL2 uh, protein shows exactly the same localization pattern as SEMPE in the adult hermaphrodite germline. And so we thought that maybe this interaction might have something to do and might have a role to play in making sure that SEMPE finds its way back to the right places here. And so the centromere is, is, formed, um, is able to form properly afterwards. And so this is again a slide where I summarize actually a lot of work uh, where we 
we're looking at how Senpei and K02 interact, because that they interact, we already knew from a previous study, but how do they interact physically? That we didn't know, and that we figured out with, with help from, um, from, from Francois Schwager in the Monica Gotter's lab. Actually, uh, here we used yeast to help us figure out these two proteins uh, indeed interact this way, and then we use um, also bacteria um, where, where we showed this in vitro as well, that this is indeed the case, that Senpei interacts through its N-terminal tail, so here, with k 2 and most likely the central domain of k 2 So this is the information we got consistently got from a bunch of different um, type of experiments to show how, how these proteins would interact. So they all confirmed it is the N-terminal tail on the Senpei side that is important for this interaction. So again, putting on the geneticist head in a way, what we like to do is then, you know, mess with it, take away this tail and see whether we can uncouple this interaction potentially. So to do that, we turn to CRISPR-Cas9. And CRISPR-Cas9 received a Nobel Prize very, very recently. It's a wonderful technique also for C.S.C. elegance. And I'd like you to think of it in the context of this talk as almost a T-Pex of the genome. Right? Think again of this book of life, of the recipe for senpei. What we did basically here was just remove the parts that codes for this internal tail bit. Just, you know, get rid of it. And so this is what we could successfully do with CRISPR-Cas9. And then we tested in vivo, in the worm, okay, can we actually uncouple senpei and KNL2? Did it work? Is that enough? So again, this is a situation. Now we have Senpei without a, the tail, or at least almost whole tail is, is gone. And K02 and then arguably cannot interact with it anymore. So to confirm that that is the case indeed, what we did is we pulled on Senpei, either the full length, having done nothing, or this tailless copy right, that we made by CRISPR. So that we can do, right? We can pull Senpei, here's full length, and here's the tailless. We can pull it. But then the question is, if we pull Senpei, does K02 come along? Because normally we know that this is the case. So that is actually here. So if you have the full length Senpei, you indeed pull along K02, as expected. But when you pull specifically the tailless variant, the tailless Senpei, that's no longer the case. K02 can, is not visible. It's not being pulled along with Senpei, meaning that indeed in the worm, in vivo, you can you can inter, you can disrupt this interaction of Senpei and KNL2. And so we thought this was going to have dire effects, like straight away, because these are such essential proteins for the centromere that this would have a, a detrimental effect on uh, cell division. Why also did we think this? Well, because we have this worm strain here. And this is going to be a tricky bit of the presentation. So please try and, uh, and follow me here, because it's going to be important. Um, here we have a strain where the worm, in this case, is heterozygous for, um, well, it's heterozygous, so it has two copies of Senpei, one full-length copy, normal, healthy, normal copy, and one where uh, the whole gene was removed. Not just the tail, the whole thing was, was kicked out. We call that the knockout. So it had a full-length copy and a knockout copy. And so let's do a little bit of Mendelian genetics here. This worm is heterozygous, has both these copies, and actually it can uh, give rise to homozygous wild-type embryos, or homozygous full-length embryos, I should say. I haven't depicted them here because they're not so interesting to us. Right? These are fine. They have two good copies. They are going to be fine. What I am showing you here is the, the, um, are the embryos that receive... Um, that they have both copies, like the mother, that are heterozygous. So they both have a full length and a knockout copy. Again, just like the mother, they are fine, right? They hatch, they, uh, they develop as normal. This is also expected. But then when worms would only, or when embryos would only get the knockout copy from, from the mother, um, or actually from, from the, the parent, that we call the P0 generation, by the way, please keep that in mind, it's the heterozygous generation then the F1 embryo that only gets the knockout copy is dead, right? So because knockout means there's no senpei, it can also divide itself, it's dead. So this is what we expected would also be the case with our mutant where we cut off a large chunk of the tail because again, senpei is so essential that we thought if we mess with it in any way, this will probably happen. But then it did not. And this is really key. Uh, this is really one of the key observations I made during my, my PhD, I think. It's this situation where 
Okay, here we're looking at this uh, heterozygous worm that has a copy, uh, the full length copy also, and this tailless copy. Again, it can give rise to another heterozygous um, embryos. They are fine. But it's this embryo that we're very intrigued by because this embryo gets only the tailless copy of Sempe. We expected it to, to be dead, but it's not. It's completely indistinguishable from, from this situation. They, they grow up. Uh, and uh, I couldn't recognize them at first as being uh, as having only these these two tailors uh, copies of Sempe. So that was a big uh, shock to us actually. But then when you let that worm grow up into an adult, able to produce embryos uh, herself, then this these embryos they would actually die. So it's that phenotype that we expected to see here. We we now saw one generation later. And so that puzzled us. Like, so what is actually the difference between this F2 embryo and this F1 embryo? Because genetically speaking, they are the same. But the mother, that's the key. That's different, right? The mother has a full-length copy and a tailless copy in the case of, of the F1. That explains, as at least it was a hypothesis, explains its viability, perhaps, because F2 they have a mother that doesn't have a full-length full -length copy. They, the mother of the F2 only has the tailless. Uh, potentially explaining why the F2 is dead and the F1 is not. So to address this very specifically, we used a technique uh, known as uh, oxin-induced degron, where we took one of these heterozygous worms, so both having the full length and the tailless, and what we could do with this technique is specifically take away the full length copy in the germline of these worms. And so doing that would only leave them with the tailless copy in the germline, and we were then wondering, okay, what then happens to its progeny? Well, the answer is quite clear, I would say. The progeny of this worm that only has the full-length copy is dead. So it seems indeed that having the full-length copy in the maternal germline of Sempe is essential for the viability of the next generation. That is what we concluded from this. And so going back to this original unique phen the phenotype that we saw, right? the tailless uh, generation that lives, uh, we wanted then to see, okay, where does it then first go wrong? Like when it, because of course, Sente makes the centromere, or marks the centromere. Can we see where this functionally goes wrong then the first time? Where, where do we see the first um, uh, problems appearing? Um, and so, again, look at this uh, like this. So you have the heterozygous mother giving rise to this F1 embryo that is homozygous for the tailless Xempe, that embryo will be fine. It will grow up into an adult, which is then laying eggs herself, that we call the F2 generation. And so in all these worms, we wanted to check cells in mitosis uh, to see where first we can find centromere defects. Like where would Xempe, for example, not be able to find its way anymore and lead to centromere defects for the first time? And to have a good readout for this, for centromere functioning as a, in a way, we were looking at um, cells in mitosis where they're just about to segregate their chromosomes. Because it's at this moment that you would find Sempe and KNO2 in this sort of very bi-oriented fashion. So when it's right, you would expect Sempe and KNO2 to be bi-oriented. And when it's not, it would not be, right? That would not be the case. So this is what we did. Uh, in these different generations. And this is what it looks like. So when you look into the heterozygous mother in the, the mitotic cells in the germline, exactly as you expect, they're completely fine. They're bi-oriented, Sempe is bi-oriented, K2 is bi-oriented, Centromere has been established properly. Then you look at the F1 embryo that has only the tailless copies, but comes from a mother with a full length copy. Still, uh, these mitotic cells look fine. The, sem the Sempe and K2 bi-orient and the Centromere has been established properly. Then later, when this um, F1 embryo turns into an adult, we can study its, its germline. Again, we look at mitotic cell in the germline of this worm, still fine. But it's then when we look at the F2 embryos, the embryos that this worm produces, and that's where we first see a huge defect. Right? Sempe is all over the place. It doesn't know where to go anymore. And K02 actually almost falls off the chromosomes. Maybe I'd want to highlight that a little bit more. Here, uh, we said, see that in a bit more detail. Here, we're looking at the first division in the embryo. 
in embryos, they come from different mothers, right? Here, the mother only had the full-length copy, so you expect nothing to go wrong. Indeed, K02 is nicely bioriented. Here, this embryo derives from a mother with a full-length copy. Again, we expect that to be fine. It is. But then here, where the embryo is derived from a mother with only the telescopy, so we call that the F2 embryo, right? K02 is falling off chromatin. Actually, it's uh, co-localizing with the with tubulin, which are these, these, these microtubules that I told you about, these spindles that come from both sides to, to segregate the chromosomes. So this is a rather dramatic uh, phenotype, I would say. And um, a consequence of this, the fact that SEMPE and KNL2 cannot find their way, cannot form the centromere, is that the kinetic core that is built on top of the centromere is also not able to form. And to confirm that, we are looking here at ROD1, which is a kinetic core component, that has fluoroform, and we just, just look at what happens to it. Like So here we have an embryo that came from a mother with a full-length copy, right? So we expect that to be fine, and this is what rod one this kinetical component, then looks like. You see all the individual chromosomes uh, appear, and you see that therefore the kinetic core has been formed, as you'd expect. But when you look at an F2 embryo, so an embryo that comes from a mother that only had the talus copy, then it looks like this. Rod 1 is present, but it has no way of finding its location. The kinetic core is not formed, and this, this phenotype we call a kinetic core null phenotype. It has no kinetic core. It has a centromere, basically no centromere, therefore no kinetic core. Right? So I hope that makes, that makes sense. So then to summarize, what we think is actually then happening over generations is this. What we think is happening here in the mother uh, that is heterozygous, uh, is that SEMPE and KNL2 interact here to establish the centromere correctly. And then this, once this has been established, this can be inherited into the next generation. So even in a generation that has no full-length SEMPE anymore, so has only this tailless copy, it can still find its way because, the again, the establishment has been done correctly. So actually the tailless and KNL2 are able to find their way to the right places, despite the fact that they cannot physically interact, they know where to go because it has been set in the mother. It's only here when this one grows up that, again, Senpe is removed and needs to be reestablished, that this cannot be done properly because this process depends on the interaction between these two factors, K02 and Senpe, and that goes through the tail, right? And so here it has, there's no tail, so this is not going to happen. Senpe goes to the wrong places, K02 even falls off chromosomes. So here is the first time you see that phenotype where basically it was laid down wrongly here. The first functional defect that you can then observe is in this M2 embryo. And so to uh, make this align a bit more with the part one summary, what we think indeed is happening is, is that the, the bringing it back to the right places is dependent of the, on the interaction of Senpe full length with K02. And actually to give a bit more nuance to this, I'm not going to show you the, the data necessarily, is what we think is that K02 might actually be there a bit earlier. So it might actually be at the right places and drag K, uh, Senpe by its tail to these right places and then correct establishment occurs and, and, and is inherited to the next generation. Again, we're talking about generations. And to be honest, this is the slide I like the best. And uh, this was drawn by, uh, by Stella. And um, if there's one slide I'd like you to take away from this presentation, it's this one. Because this summarizes what's going on, right? what's happening in terms of inheritance. So here, again, we have this book of life with the senpei recipe here opened, opened up, right? So this mother is the heterozygous mother, has a correct copy of senpei, so the correct recipe. Its child does not, right? Its child only has the tailors recipe, but it doesn't matter because the mother can help her child to set centr the centromeres right, right. So it's almost like reading a bedtime story and it's reading this recipe for senpei to its child. Its child can inherit this information despite that it does not have this information it's herself. And that is problematic, right? Because when the worm, this worm, grows up in, and becomes a mother herself, then she cannot read that recipe to her child. It's a very sad uh, cartoon, really. Uh, she cannot read this recipe, uh, and so her child will never develop. Right. So I, I hope that you'll be able to, to to see what's going on by by this. I think very well drawn cartoon. 
Um, and then it leads me to the summary of, I would say, the entire thesis in one slide. Because uh, this is what I've been doing, right? I've been showing you how we think that SEMPE is removed. We think um, this is done by the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. And, and actually, SEMPE also shielded from premature removal by MET33. And I've also shown you how we think that it's finding its way back. And we think that this is dependent on the, SEMPE intera the interaction of SEMPE through its N-terminal tail with KNL2. And so I've, I've been talking about this research for quite, quite a while with different people. And they always ask me this very good question of how, what's the bigger picture? What can we take away from this? And then I always like to zoom out a little bit, right? Because we've, we've been very much zoomed in on the C. elegans situation. But what I want to stress here is that SEMPE is a common mark, right? It's actually used to mark the centromeres in almost all organisms that we know. And so it's incredibly important that it finds its way in all these species, regardless of the organization of the of centromere. And so this question of how does SEMPE find its right, right place is actually really, really relevant, right? Not only in C. elegans, but in many, many of these other species as well. And to maybe stress this even more and... Um, give a bit of more of a, a tangible example, uh, when SEMPE does not find its right location, this can actually support things like cancer, like tumoral ge tumor genesis, like cancer. Uh, in many human cancers, you find SEMPE actually being in the wrong places. What we think is then happening is that it's diluting away the kinetical components and centromere components from the native centromeres and leads to this genomic instability that, again, as I said, supports tumor tumoral genesis and also leads to a very poor outcome uh, prognosis-wise. So, so this question is even relevant in the, in the context of, of cancer, that, that SEMPE finds its, its right uh, place. But then to end with, I like to think of something a bit more conceptual. So what I've shown you here is a form of inheritance that is just really interesting. We're not the, we're not the only ones, neither the first to show it, but still it's worth mentioning. It's not only about getting the book, right? it's not only about getting the DNA from your parents, it's more than that. It's actually things that are, you could say, on top of the book. And so in biology, we have a very fancy name for that, we call it epigenetics. And, and, and here we, we provide an interesting example, I think, of this. So again, I want to leave you with this image here of it's the book that you get from your parents, but it's also these little post-it cards, in this case from the mother, telling you in this case, where or how to direct SEMPE and how to set up your centromeres properly. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in this work. Um, many people have been. Um, and of course, first, I want to start with thanking uh, everyone in the lab. And first and foremost, uh, well, Professor Florian Steiner, of course, for allowing me to join the lab. And I, I think I can honestly say I didn't have the most straightforward career path. Uh, so I think he took a bit of a chance when he hired me. And I, I like to think that, that it all worked out uh, for the best. And, and, and it really helped me uh, reignite my, my passion for scientific research. And, and, and I think I, I'm very grateful to Florian for that, for that opportunity. And then, of course, I want to thank the entire lab for being great colleagues and, and having lots of amazing conversations, whether it's science or more personal. Um, so thanks to all the current and past members. And in particular, I need to thank the people that were directly involved in the work. Uh, Johanna Venda, Camila Delaney, Car Caroline Gabu, uh, and in Professor Mo uh, Monica Gotta's lab, Prof well, Professor Monica Gotta herself, and Francois Schwag uh, Schwager for the help with the yeast 2 hybrid. Um, then I'd like to thank uh, Nicola Rogli for making, uh, helping me make the figures and Stella and Jean-Paul Tone for helping me think about how to present it to you today, you know, how to present this work. And then I'd also like to thank Professor Ramesh Pillai and Professor Marco Kaksan for being part of my first year TAC committee and Professor Patrick Moraldi and Professor Patrick Hoyne for being part of the thesis committee today alongside with uh, Professor Florian Steiner, of course.